Good morning. This is Jenna ILA for Abolition News Network, December 1st, 1793. Today we have with us probably the first religious leader who openly advocated emancipation of the slaves to our new government. He is a congressional minister from Rhode Island and has influenced the abolition of the slave trade in his state. Welcome, Reverend Samuel Hopkins. Thank you, Ms. Olay. Good morning. Um, Reverend Hopkins, tell us some, first something about what happened to slavery in Rhode Island and what that has to do with you. Well, Ms. Olay, I was originally a slaveholder. But as a theologian, I found that slavery was in conflict with what I had learned from studying the scriptures. For example, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24 says that no man may serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will hold to one and despise the other. My efforts coincided with the 1774 law, which forbade the importation of slaves into Rhode Island, and the 1784 law, which granted freedom to all slaves born in Rhode Island after March 1785. Well, that's pretty clear. Um, why do you think slavery took hold in our Christian country in the first place? I'd say it seems as though there was a public relations line, as if someone said that even though the trade seemed morally wrong, it was lawful, just, and even humane, because the slave might be rescued from being condemned for violations against African customs by being bought by the Christian traders. Servitude to whom would be considered a great privilege compared to bondage by their own countrymen. Yes, I can see that may seem to be good advertisement point for the slave trade, but what is the real truth as you see it in the slave trade? Well, in truth, the slave trade was conducted only to serve mercenary purposes, not to benefit the Africans at all. Wars in Africa were often excited by the spirituous liqueurs, which were given to tribal chiefs in exchange for slaves. Every manner of fraud was perpetrated in order to obtain subjects for traffic. I see. Now, did you speak up against that in church? Yes, I did. I thought at first that there would be resentment if I spoke from the pulpit against slavery, but I was surprised to find that a large number of influential men saw that there was much ground in the scriptures for what I had said. Hmm. Very good. Now, did you put any of that in writing? I certainly did. When the Continental Congress met in June 1776, I published a pamphlet entitled A Dialogue Concerning the Slavery of Africans. I have a copy of it here. This showed it to be the duty and the interest of the American states to emancipate all African slaves. Excellent. That must have been the first time that the subject was brought before the government. Um, explain your idea of how you envision emancipation would work. I believe it is just for masters to be remunerated for their slaves. Money could be borrowed to purchase the freedom of an honest and religious slave, who would then repay his master by his labors the sum borrowed. Hmm. That's pretty fair. Um, you are pretty kind on both sides. I would say so. Oh, and one more thing. Anyone advocating for their liberation should provide for the preparation of the Africans for liberty in a civilized and Christian community. All right. Now, is there anything else that you published? Yes. I just published a system of doctrines contained in Divine Revelation Explained and Defined this year, 1793. Very good. Now, um, could you tell us what you mean by divine revelation? In a few words, while I was studying the question of why God shows mercy to some while abandoning others to sin, I found that the answer was, because the Lord has a will of his own. And what is this will? It is to do what is best. For example, if it is not best for a sinner to be saved, the Lord will not save him. But if it is best that he be saved, no matter how many sins he has, he will be pardoned. In summary, the moral character of God is that he is benevolence, or disposed to do the greatest possible good. Hmm. That is an incredible point. Um, now before we end, um, do you have anything else from the scriptures that you would like our viewers to remember to go with you? Uh, yes. The second letter to Timothy, 
chapter 2, verses 20 and 21 imply that the righteous and the wicked are equally designed for God's use as vessels of gold, silver, wood, and earth are. And yet the agency of God does not interfere with the free agency of either the righteous or the wicked. Each is a creature or a created being. Interesting. Thank you, Reverend Hopkins. Um, this is Jenna I. Olay for Abolition News Network, reminding you to read 2 Timothy 2, 20-21. Good morning.